Hi everyone, Mitch Jackson broadcasting via Human.Social. Welcome to another episode of the Human Side Interviews. Today I've got a fascinating guest that is making our world a better place, a safer place, and that's Mr. Alex Holden. And I'm going to introduce Alex to you so you can really appreciate what he's all about and all of the safety precautions that he's bringing to the table for, for companies, for businesses, doing business online, on the internet, and on social media. Alex Holden is the founder and CISO of Hold Security LLC. His experience unites work from leadership positions within corporate data security and security and corporate data security and security consulting. Under his leadership, Hold Security played a pivotal role in information security and threat intelligence, becoming one of the most recognizable names in the field. Mr. Holden is credited with the discovery of many high-profile breaches, including Adobe Systems, initial vendor breach that led to the discovery of the J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, and the independent discovery of the Target breach that all of us have read about in the paper. In 2014 he discovered, and I need you to pay attention to this, he discovered the largest breach to date and that's dubbed the Cyber Vore breach. He recovered over 1.2 billion, and that's billion with a B, stolen credentials, usernames, passwords, things like that, that were taken from over 420,000 websites that were unprotected. He leads Hold Security in helping all size businesses including global Fortune 500 companies with their data security needs. He's considered one of the leading security experts in the country if not in the world and he regularly voices his professional opinion in mainstream media including CNN, the New York Times and Rudders. Alex, thanks for being on the Human Side interviews today. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mitch. So I think what we need to do is start off, who's watching the show today, Alex? Is it just you and I? Do we have our regular audience? Or do you think because you're on the show, we might have some other people tuning in and paying attention that we might not want to have on the show? Is that something we need to be concerned with? Well, you never know, but uh, the hackers actually like to know their competition. They like to know who is uh, watching them. So most likely it will get their attention, but hopefully in a good way to know that uh, we are watching them and uh, we are winning the battle. Why don't we start off, Alex, with, uh, and I don't want you to tip your hand as to any of your, your technology business secrets or anything like that, but let's talk about the 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 billion usernames, passwords, credentials that you discovered. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and exactly what did you discover? What was it that you found? So initially what we did is uh, we discovered just a group of hackers uh, from um, uh, central Russia and uh, this group was uh, completely remarkable because uh, all they did is spam. They sent um, their uh, little bears through the email and they were trying to solicit uh, people uh, to buy them. We see that every day and they never uh, ra raised uh, any attention because how they uh, did their business. But uh, because they affected uh, several of our customers, we start looking in depth on their operation, trying to figure out uh, what they're up to. The results of our six months investigation was uh, absolutely re remarkable. This gang not only managed to do their business well, they managed to breach trust of so many businesses and individuals that, uh, to the best of our knowledge, had not been done before or since. They uh, breached 420,000 websites on the internet, stealing uh, only the credentials, username and passwords to those sites, but then they used that information to propagate their spams through email uh, to which um, the credentials were fitting or through social media like uh, Twitter and others um, where this, um, they could uh, peddle this information further. So they just uh, automated the biggest in history type of uh, scam 
that was rather successful. So we were, com were compelled to bring this forward uh, for the uh, public to know. Explain to me when you talk about a six-month investigation, and I certainly don't want you to reveal any of your industry secrets, any of the tools or techniques you're using to, to find out who's hacking who and what information is being taken, but for a lot of us that watch TV, that read books, uh, go to the movies, we see computer specialists going online and tracking down the hackers and hacking another system or server. So we have in our mind an idea of maybe what you're doing, but generally speaking, what did that six-month investigation entail? I mean, are you logging onto their servers? Are you diving into the deep web and finding uh, uh, signals as to items being stolen? What exactly are you talking about? So, uh, unfortunately, the things in real life take much longer than they do in the movies. Uh, nobody would watch six <laughs> months old long movie, <laughs> right? But, right, uh, right. Uh, in, in our business, uh, we identify uh, these malicious uh, people, we call them actors, malicious actors, uh, on the internet, and we try to track them. Once we start tracking them uh, through the forums where they are maybe peddling their goods or through other medias um, or their websites, we start establishing the human relationships. This is not something where, you know, we found the web server and uh, downloaded the information like it was this case with Adobe. This was more of a human uh, type of interaction that led us uh, to gain their trust to get some insights of the operation. So it, it, it takes time, and uh, you have to appreciate that there are, it, it's not a marathon conversation that we had with them. It just uh, took us uh, weeks, if not months, to get to the point of trust where they start sharing information and letting us take a look at their systems. What you're describing, does that involve using what most of us would consider normal Internet access, or does that involve going down into the deep web and developing relationships at that particular level. It, it does take uh, a lot of uh, the deep web uh, capabilities because we need to have so-called street creds for them to talk to us in the first place. So the conversations don't happen on uh, Google or Yahoo or you know major uh, places where you would see people converse or interact. It doesn't happen via email. It happens on those uh, dark forums of the internet uh, through the channels like internet relay chats and uh, other uh, technologies um, where we can start interacting with those people. Um, obviously, we don't announce ourselves as a you know uh, analyst from Hold Security, uh, but um, we get into this uh, professional relationship with these people, asking about uh, their techniques, asking about their game, and then um, you know basically you have to kind of play it as a poker game. Never uh, shows you surprise or amazement. I don't think I'd ever want to sit at a poker table with you. I'd just go ahead and write you a check and give you my money. I think you guys are probably the best at what you do. For those viewers that are just joining us, those listening on a podcast version, Alex, which we'll be putting out later today, uh, I'm speaking with Alex Holden. He's the founder of Hold Security LLC, uh, one of the top Internet security companies in the world, the gentleman that did find and discover $1.2 billion stolen credentials uh, by Russian hackers uh, recently that he shared with the public and it's been in the news and that's one reason Alex on the show today. Alex, you mentioned the deep web and we talked about the dark net. Can you share with our viewers what exactly are you talking about? What is the deep web and why do businesses, why do consumers, why do individuals need to be concerned with that? Well, there are several layers of the internet. Obviously, there is internet that we all know and love and use every day that allows us to interact, learn, and uh, basically utilize for all our needs. And then there is a level of internet um, that uh, is private. And some companies have private networks. Some um, um, people want to have private conversations. To a certain degree, our email is a uh, way to have a private conversation. But it's still hosted somewhere and somebody can interact or interrupt it. The hackers, as they're being chased by authorities, got into the deep web. 
the places uh, on the internet that are very difficult to get into. Some of their uh, places require special passwords, special certificates, special assurances. In a way, it's like, you know, really secret handshake that you need to know, plus you need to know the address to which to go. So this is really done uh, by the word of mouth by uh, the groups uh, that only trust their own. And uh, this is a part of Deep Web that's not searchable by Google, they're not searchable uh, or accessible by average users. You may be able to get to the front door, but you can't get much further. And the front door, usually not the front door, it's just a fake entrance. And what I've read, Alex, is the front door oftentimes changes locations. Don't a lot of these hackers set up a site, set up a a chat room or whatever it might be, it's up for a little while and then it's gone and they set it up someplace else? Is that is that accurate? Absolutely. Uh, in our experience, uh, these things happen all the time. The hackers move their locations, the uh, meeting places change, and that also um, designed to weed out the people who got into the, those circles and then they lost, uh, dropped out of uh, privilege or uh, betrayed their own. The, there is a you know dog eats dog kind of environment where the hackers don't trust their own and they have their own systems of trust. So it's always changing. It's uh, one of the most dynamic places on the internet that there is. You know, uh, last year before we took a family trip to Amsterdam, I made the mistake of reading, I forgot the name of the book, but it might have been called Anonymous. It was a book that came out a year ago about Anonymous. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I wish I didn't read this before leaving town, hopping on an airplane and flying to the other side of the country because it talks about how unsecure most of our passwords are, how you have to protect all your data, and I felt like there was so much that I needed to do to protect my personal data, my law firm data before leaving town that I simply didn't have time to do. If I had known you back then, I would have picked up the phone and said, Alex, what do we need to do to get your company into the law firm and help make me safe? Um, now, having said that, there's a, there's a segue here, and that is a couple of high-profile hacks in the news uh, that you've been interviewed about, you've talked about, I've read about in magazines and watched on TV. Adobe. Uh, Sony Pictures, Anthem Blue Cross, companies like that. Can you share with our viewers how, uh, your understanding as to how was it that those hacks were allowed to happen in the first place and what could these companies have done to, if anything, to have uh, prevented those hacks from happening? Well, I, I think um, each case has a, its own um, different uh, story, but in many cases, like with Sony, we've seen an issue uh, that was disclosed that it was stolen credentials, uh, where something called phishing, where um, an administrator was fooled to um, uh, reveal other credentials or access to uh, his or her system uh, through malicious email. So in some of these cases, we do see uh, the uh, very weak point uh, being a human being, which is uh, very normal, but uh, this person uh, simply giving away the keys to the castle, N not knowing that they're dealing with a hacker or rather maybe dealing with authority, with a manager or something like that. Target was the same story when uh, access uh, granted to a vendor was uh, stolen from the vendor. And it's uh, very important to understand that uh, companies may spend millions and millions of dollars on their defenses within their perimeter, but anything outside of their perimeter is really often beyond their control. Uh, that was also a case with J.P. Morgan Chase when uh, a site that uh, was uh, looking at a marathon or some sports activity uh, had been hacked, stealing uh, some of the information about the employees. It's always a course of actions of uh, the employees, um, whether it's uh, warranted or not, whether it um, got, uh, get the, uh, the hackers further in. It's perhaps the case with Anthem. In case it was Adobe, we still don't know what the initial uh, issue was because in some cases it's just uh, administrators don't fix their systems, so don't patch their systems fast enough. But overall, the human element is often at fault, which, uh, you know, we all human, we all make mistakes. Some of them are much costlier than others. When you take that human element into consideration, it sounds to me as though if you have some type of security 
set up where there are multiple layers, uh, helping protect the company's data, helping protect a company from mistakes of their own employees or from their vendors. Um, that might be a way to go. What type of recommendations do you make to companies like this to help protect their data? What can they do to avoid this type of event happening to them, generally well, speaking? Uh, well, for most importantly, to make sure that uh, the employees are well aware about the security and the policy. Because uh, education is something that many companies are lacking as far as explaining the necessary steps to safeguard the data. But secondarily, and uh, maybe as importantly, uh, the companies uh, have to be looking not only at the front door that um, um, hackers may be trying to break into, but they also should be looking at the exits from the company. In case of Adobe and the case with Sony, uh, pretty much everything that the company held uh, near and dear was taken out of the company. So, you know, if you compare the security of these companies to security of your own house, you know, you, you may miss a person stealing a wallet because it's such a small thing. But if somebody is trying to take out the grand piano out of your house, somebody has to know this. So this proactive defense to understand that uh, you can't secure the perimeter at 100%, but looking out of what can be leaving your company, that's, I think, one of the major things that currently is a mess. Is, do we have the ability today to completely protect our companies from people leaving with the data, whether it's through a hack or, or some other way? Is there a 100% uh, satisfaction guaranteed type of process to keep hackers from, from getting to your data or are we at the technology level where if a hacker wants to come in and take your data and spend the time and money and resources to do so there's just not that much you can do about it. What's the current state of affairs? You, you can always come up with a scenario where the hackers can steal something, whether it's like in the movies where they drop off their, um, um, their planes and parachutes and they get into the build, secure building, or if they exploit uh, the employee uh, information, or if they just uh, go through something that um, uh, that system administrator had missed. There are always ways and today, so there is not such a concept of 100% something uh, secure, uh, but we are getting better. And the, the message is that um, we are hearing about the breaches all the time, but we're definitely getting better uh, at the security. Um, we are actually winning the battle rather than um, uh, getting average or worse. Uh, the hackers are on the run. So there are visible improvements, and unfortunately, we are in progress. Um, and the work in progress, unfortunately, shows faults. Do, do companies, do governments uh, ever take the initiative and try to hack the hackers uh, to shut them down before an attack actually happens? Does that ever happen? Um, I don't know about that, so um, perhaps, but I uh, never heard of uh, the, uh, something credible like that. Okay, I, I was just curious because it seems to me like if there's a, a known problem out there, if you, if you attack the issue head on and, and, and be the one to you know, initiate resolving the issue rather than responding, um, that might be another way of dealing with this type of, type of situation. It's just the business sports guy. I mean, that's just the way I was brought up rather than waiting for something to happen. Uh, changing directions real quick with the, you know, I'm out here in Orange County, California, close to Los Angeles, close to the Sony Pictures uh, hack scenario. It's in the news every day. What are your thoughts on that? Do you have any opinion, if you can share it with us, as to who was behind that particular hack and whether or not anything, any important data was actually uh, taken? Well, Sony Breach was interesting by itself because uh, it was not financially motivated. It was uh, perhaps politically motivated, but uh, unlike most of the breaches that you hear about uh, nowadays, uh, there was no financial um, motive as far as we know. Because of that, this shows how every single company there is vulnerable and can be exploited, whether it's uh, an internal uh, situation with uh, disgruntled employees or if it's a foreign government or if it's a extortion because extortion is uh, growing popular again. The problem with the uh, situation with Sony is that uh, Sony was uh, appeared to be blind uh, 
to the breach uh, until it was too late. And at the point when the hackers took all the data that mattered from Sony, uh, they made their appearance um, known. So in that situation, it was too late. Uh, based on some of the analysis that we've done, uh, we uh, uh, still don't know who did this. But uh, you know, the language, for ex example, that was used by the hackers, uh, more uh, reminiscent of uh, European language than of uh, native speaker, rather than um, somebody from uh, North Korea. But that's just on a linguistic level. So there may be multiple groups in play, multiple individuals. At the very end, because uh, the hackers never delivered on their big promise to destroy uh, Sony Pictures, either it was on Christmas uh, Day or on New Year's Day, uh, you know, maybe this is, was not done by a huge um, country-sponsored uh, uh, hacker group, because also would usually deliver on the threat. Perhaps it was done by a smaller group of. Um, uh, people who had personal vendetta against Sony. You know, it's interesting to see after all of that is said and done, how many people actually downloaded and watched the movie, the interview, who probably would not have watched that movie in the first place. I mean, there's a lot of dynamics there that makes me wonder what exactly happened. Uh, Alex, let's just say I'm a company, large Fortune 500 company, and I, I for whatever reason, I believe I've just been hacked. Uh, which steps should I take next to either preserve evidence, to preserve data, uh, to protect myself uh, from that point forward? What do you suggest people do? And what's the biggest mistake you see companies make after they've been hacked that they hopefully can avoid making? Well, and this, this advice doesn't only apply to Fortune 500, it applies pretty much for every company. First of all, you need to get a handle on the situation. And that handle on the situation sometimes varies because it depends what you could lose and what uh, have been lost. So in uh, some of the cases where we see uh, that the company tries to make a rush decision to basically cut off the arm because the uh, finger is bleeding. So, you know, getting the handle of what could have been taken, how it was uh, taken, and preserve the evidence is very important. Secondarily, and possibly as importantly, um, looking at um, what, how to recover and how to assert that uh, the consumer base the, their clients, uh, their vendors, partners, and employees um, can still continue with their lives uh, without any significant financial or other impact. So that that's a very difficult situation. Some companies uh, find themselves in a situation like Target in the middle of a uh, Christmas uh, season. They still have to continue the operation. Other companies like Sony simply shut down most of their operations because of magnitude of a breach. But getting the right people to advise them and guide them through the process, because the process was very dangerous uh, and uh, very um, cumbersome. Um, in many cases that we've seen that uh, when the company finds out that uh, they had been breached, the hackers are still in the system and the hackers create multiple ways to get back in, and if only one of them gets shut down, multiple may open. And we've seen this uh, situation multiple times, uh, much to our disappointment. So once uh, your company comes in and starts assisting a new client who's been hacked, it sounds to me like one of the things that you do is you check the systems, you check the servers, their cloud resources, whatever it might be, to make sure there's still not a hacker uh, silently waiting for the noise to die down, so that here, so that it can start hacking some more. Is that is that a fair statement? Absolutely. The first question that we ask is, uh, is it still ongoing? And if it's still ongoing, uh, if it's not, we ask, are you sure? Because uh, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, plugging one hole doesn't mean that the, the, all the other holes been identified. I would even suggest a CEO telling you, oh, we're not being hacked anymore, it's handled. You know what? I think maybe independently have you guys go in and confirm that. 
if, the, uh, if, the, if the owner of the company knew what was going on in the first place, there's a pretty good ch chance the security would have been up correctly in the first place, and maybe the hack wouldn't have happened. But let, can we change directions real quick? Sure. You, mentioned, you mentioned consumers, and there's something that's going on now in society, and it's um, uh, security apps for your phone where you download the app, you change the lock on your house and you can start locking and securing your home from an app on your phone or you can access your automobile using an app instead of a, a manual key, things like that. What are your thoughts on this new technology? Is it something that we should embrace? Should we be concerned with the lack of security? Because I've heard the security is pretty bad on these apps. Um, just, just your thoughts. Well, any innovation technology that's, that's useful should be embraced, but it should be embraced uh, very cautiously because uh, in many cases uh, the functionality of the app is, uh, had not been completely tested for security. And it, if it um, had been tested for security, did, was it tested for all the possible scenarios? Uh, we see a lot of things in Europe uh, where your phone becomes your virtual wallet. And, um, you know, it's not as prevalent here in the United States, but in Europe, uh, uh, hacking phones is much uh, more common. And even the ransomware, uh, when your phone gets completely locked out and the hackers uh, demand uh, for you to deposit uh, $5, let's say, into their account, it's very common in Europe. So in the same way, when, as we get more and more use and um, you know, money into our wallets, virtual money, that is, uh, we need to be much more careful. Because the hackers, if they take over, over your phone, in some cases, they may take over your house. Uh, controls or your car controls. Imagine a situation where hackers um, get, uh, take control over your phone and download information like uh, what kind of car you have, where it's located, and if the phone is anywhere near to, uh, by the car. That way they can go on a black market and try to sell the location of your car and then lock codes um, for the local thieves to be able to just walk to the car knowing that the owner is nowhere in sight and try to steal it. So. The technology is still evolving, and I'm sure that we'll see positive and negative things about the security. Hopefully, it would be improving across the board. Do the apps and, and software that are password lockers, uh, I'm not sure what you call them, but you basically download the app, it, can, it encrypts your passwords as you browse the internet, it's something that only you can access. Is that a good idea for consumers and businesses to use? Or is that something that just really doesn't work with an experienced hacker? Uh, it actually works really well uh, for the consumer protection. Uh, there are potential caveats with some of the solutions because uh, hackers can, in theory, take screenshots of your phone. So if you can look at your password, the hackers may look at um, the same screen as you do. But in many cases, uh, um, these are very advanced and unique uh, systems for the hackers. Having uh, something um, on your phone typically better secure with your phone than let's say on your computer. Yet uh, some of the technologies are better than others. So it's still again work in progress. Well you know I'm tell you what my life's been a work in progress and I was around before the internet as we know it. I was doing business before you know, the easy to use web was available and it's just been a fascinating journey watching business develop, technology develop, how we communicate, how we're communicating right now, meeting people like you that I might not otherwise meet and then to watch the technology and the whole hacking issues uh, progress over the years and develop and become more refined. It's just a fascinating area of of business, of technology. Alex, what got you into this business? You have a slight accent. I think maybe you're from Texas. I can't put my finger on it. But um, what got you interested in technology and security and software and things like that? Well, right, my accent, absolutely from Texas, far eastern Texas. In fact, eastern I worked, Texas. Uh, well, just east from there. Uh, I, I was born in uh, Kiev, which is uh, in Ukraine, uh, and spent first 12 years of my life living there. So that's where I acquired this uh, 
uh, accent. Uh, but uh, spending 25 years in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, most of my uh, life and my entire adult life, um, got me interested in technology. As I was going to be a mechanical engineer, I really found like. Uh, I found liking in uh, computer technology, which was just evolving at the time. And uh, there I went through a number of different uh, hats in the computer world. I tried my um, hand in programming, figuring out that I don't like it and I'm not very good at it. Then I uh, learned uh, network administration and uh, then went into Windows, which was just emerging as a you know good, solid platform for the companies. Um, so I have very good background in technology, and then I got into security because I was uh, given an opportunity to kind of bring all of these uh, components into one. And uh, at the time, that was uh, just around 9-11, uh, I was working for a large brokerage firm that was uh, affected, uh, unfortunately, by the tragedy of 9-11. Um, three days later, I was standing in the office of a CIO and asking uh, our CIO a question, what if the next uh, attack of terrorists would be over the Internet? And that day is when I was uh, given a uh, position and uh, freedom to learn more about security and implement security from ground up within uh, that company. So spending 10 years as a chief information security officer with that company really gave me a good background in security, uh, but at the same time I was very interested in tinkering with things. So uh, when uh, tinkering with things and the security that was just developing as we know uh, right now, um, it was uh, a fascinating journey uh, kind of growing up there. And then when I went into consulting business, um, it our customers were asking not only how to get more secure, but they came to us after the breach and said, you know, how do we recover from this? And most importantly, who did this to us? Why were we targeted? So using uh, my native language skills of Russian and Ukrainian, uh, I had a little bit of a head start uh, compared to much of competition because I was able to understand uh, Eastern European hacking hackers and um, trying to get into the way they operated to bring uh, some closure and some ca kind of a resolution for many of our hacker um, clients and uh, we were actually able to stop, stop some of the hacking attempts against our clients through that knowledge. So that's kind of a short story of my uh, Texas accent. <laughs> You know, it, it's an interesting time to be alive, isn't it? I mean, it sounds like you've actually watched, like I have, all of this technology uh, get created, start to develop, and then uh, start to be used in many different ways, both good and bad. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm one person, I'm one guy that's glad that you're on our side. Okay? And, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And do me a favor, if uh, viewers of the show, listeners of the podcast, uh, owners of companies, uh, businesses, both big and small, if they're interested in connecting with you and having your company step in, maybe doing a security analysis and or uh, step in and help protect their data uh, from hackers, from uh, corporate espionage, whatever it might be, how can our viewers get in, get in touch with you? How can they uh, get their questions answered and their security needs met? Well, uh, first of all, our website is www.holdsecurity.com. Hold security is one word. Uh, that's our primary way to understand what uh, hold security can do uh, and um, help with security. And there is a way to uh, contact us. Um, we have a Twitter feed at uh, hold security um, and um, uh, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook pages like that as well. But most importantly, we try to encourage companies to get educated and smart about cybersecurity because in many cases, we know that some companies think that they're secure while they are not, or in some cases, they need some kind of secondary assurances. So education is the main thing, and I talk in many uh, places and um, you know take uh, this great opportunity that you're providing just to talk about educational process where the companies need to get smarter about protecting the data that uh, their customers entrust to them. 
We've been speaking with Alex Holden of Hold Security LLC. Alex speaks and shares his thoughts on digital security, business security on CNN, the New York Times, and on Rudders. If you'd like to touch base with Alex and have him educate uh, the executives in your company, the employees in your company, and make certain specific uh, data protection recommendations to help protect your important data, uh, he's the guy to see. Alex, thanks for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'm looking forward to contacting you and maybe talking internet security, my friend. Thank you so much, Mitch, for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for being on the show. Everyone, take care. You can check out past episodes of the Human Side Interviews, upcoming episodes at human.social. And until our next interview, our next conversation, please have a great day. And remember to always make today your digitally safe day of the week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.